Conspiracy theories have fascinated minds of millions of people around the world. Is the world led by a secret deep state familiar from the TV series The X-Files? Is there social structures and world politics just a stage in the middle of all these secret power games? Are conspiracy theories a modern phenomenon or are they part of an ancient game of politics? Is there any basis of truth in conspiracy theories? Or are they just criticism from people tired about the way things currently are in the world? What is the worldview of a conspiracy theorist like? We will be discussing these and many other questions with our guest today. Welcome to follow the Worldview series of RTV. In this episode, we are going to discuss conspiracy, conspiracy theories. My name is Alan Craig, and our guest expert is a worldwide renowned social critic and conspiracy theorist. His name is David Icke. Welcome to our show, David. Thank you. Before we start, do you know where conspiracy theorists came from? Or conspiracy theory? Which is now, not by you there, but by the mainstream media, is used as a a label of um, discrediting someone. Oh, it's a conspiracy theorist, conspiracy theorist. Well, actually, the vast majority of it's based on facts, so it's not really a conspiracy theory. But it came from the CIA. Okay. In the 1960s, the documents exist. In the 1960s, um, when people in America were having the audacity to question the Kennedy assassination official story, and uh, were not buying the idea that a magic bullet went through several people and how a bullet came, coming from the back made Kennedy's head go uh, 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 in the same direction from the other way. They must have U-turn bullets in America in those days. Those people were questioning that. The, the CIA literally put out documents to the mainstream media uh, in um, America uh, listing ways to discredit people who were um, uh, not buying the official story. And, and they said, call them conspiracy theories and conspiracy theorists. Mm -hmm. yeah. And they're still going all these decades later. And the mainstream media will have no idea where it came from, but they're still using it. Well, David, we know you're currently on a worldwide tour. Talk about different conspiracies in your show, your lecture, and the name of your tour is Everything You Need to Know But Have Never Been Told. And we know you have a fantastic experience over 30 years looking into all of these different aspects of life, from politics to social life. And I'd like to ask you, where did you start? What was the turning point for you in your life? People might perceive that I, I talk about lots of different, quote, conspiracies. I don't. Yeah. Talk about one, mm -hmm. which has many, many faces, but it's one, and that is um, a network of people, of secret societies, like a global web, that are manipulating the world towards a centralized, fascist, um, communist, whatever you want to call it, tyranny, in which a tiny few, currently now known as the 1%, um, dictate the lives in fine detail of everyone else, including connecting the human brain to artificial intelligence, which is basically the end game of it. And we're not that far away unless we wake up. So um, I was a, a professional footballer at one time, and then arthritis finished my career and I became a journalist. I became a newspaper journalist, a radio journalist, a television journalist with the BBC. And uh, I also got in very, interested in the environment during the 1980s. And eventually I became, with a series of amazing coincidences, a national spokesman for the Green Party. Um, and then some very strange things started to happen, which you, with your background, will understand. I've read about your background. Yeah. I, I knew about you being a uh, TV sports personality, yeah. but I look back and I've and seen very interesting um, things that happened to you. Yeah, because what happened was through 1989, when I was a national spokesman for the Green Party and still a television presenter with the BBC, I started having very strange experiences. Um, for instance, if I was in a room alone, it was like I wasn't alone. It was like there was something there. 
And, you know, I, I'd not lived a life in which I was, you know, I, I mean, I was really open to the paranormal. I mean, some of the explanations for life I, I, I thought were a joke. I never bought religion. Uh, I never bought mainstream science version of everything where everything is, you know, just a cosmic accident. It made no sense to me. But I hadn't really looked into alternatives. So alternatives started looking into me. And uh, this went on and on through 1989 into early 1990. And it, it became so, so tangible that I was working for the BBC one night. I was in a hotel in London called the Kensington Hilton Hotel just across from the BBC. And this presence in the room was so tangible by then. I was sitting on the side of the bed on my own. And I said, look, if there's something there, would you please contact me? Because you'll drive me up the wall. And um, about um, a very short time later, a matter of days later, uh, long story short, I'm, I'm, um, I'm with my, my son, uh, uh, Gareth, who's now you know singer-songwriter, in his um, 30s, he was a little boy then. And um, he was looking at some books in a, uh, a newsagent shop. And um, I, I said to him, Gaz, um, let's go and get some lunch. And as I turned or went to turn, the whole atmosphere changed. Um, it was like another, it was, it was the, 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 the atmosphere just, was not the same. What I what I, I understand now is some kind of electromagnetic field had started to come around me. And and it was very weird. And then I heard, it wasn't a voice, but I heard a very strong thought form say, go and look at the books on the far side. Yeah. Um, and of course, you're standing there completely bewildered of what's going on. And I, I walked across towards these books, in, you know, what the hell? And, and these books were all, romantic novels. I knew that shop very well. That's, that's all they sold. But in the middle of these books, when I got there, was a woman's face and it was a book called Mind to Mind. It was by a, a, a professional psychic called Betty Shine. And I, I didn't know that, didn't know her, picked it up, turned it over. And I picked it up because it was different to the others. And I read the blurb, I saw the word psychic. And uh, immediately I thought, I wonder if she'd pick up what I've been feeling this last year. So I read it in 24 hours, wrote to her, went to see her, went a couple of times. And what I said to her was, because she did this hands-on healing, this exchange of energy. I said, look, I've got arthritis. Maybe you could help. I didn't tell her anything about what was happening to me at all. And I went a couple of times and that was fine. We had a nice chat and stuff. And then the third time I'm sitting on this, this, this medical bench thing in a front room. Near Brighton it was, in the south of England. And uh, she... Um, she'd said in her book, I'd read it, that sometimes when other dimensions of reality are trying to lock into you, it feels like sometimes you've got a spider's web on your face. Um, and I'm sitting there on that third occasion and suddenly I felt like a spider's web on my face, really, really um, clear. And of course, what was that? It was an electromagnetic field. It's the same uh, experience that people have when the, the hairs on the back of the head stand up, it, it, when they're in the middle of a, uh, an excited crowd. And um, about 10, 15 seconds later, she, she launches her head back. I've said nothing to her. And she says, my God, this is powerful. I've got to close my eyes to, to, uh, for this. And then she, she goes into, into psychic mode and tells me that she's being told to pass information on to me. Um, and, you know, just to emphasize at this time, I'm not into any of this at all that I'm into now, big time. I'm just presenting the sport for the BBC and I'm a national spokesman for the British Green Party. She starts telling me that I'm gonna go out on a world stage and reveal great secrets. Mm -hmm. That quote, one man cannot change the world, but one man can communicate the message that can change the world. That, 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 that basically there, there, there is a, a, a massive secret about the world that the, the, the people need to know. Also told me something else, and, and, and in what followed also, that there was a vibrational change coming, a frequency change coming, that was going to start to wake humanity up from its, from its coma, from its, uh, what I would call its perceptual program, and, and people were going to see what they hadn't seen before. Um, and, this is the key that from what followed. Um, 
one of the messages that I was given that day, and I'm sitting there thinking, what's going on, was we are going to lead him to knowledge and at other times we'll put knowledge into his mind. And, um, you know, there, there was an advertisement on British television ran for a long time for um, actually fence paint. And, uh, and, the, and the, the, um, the tagline of this advert was, it does exactly what it says on the tin. Well, all I can say is for the last 30 years, nearly 30 years, that message, we will put knowledge into his mind and lead him to knowledge, has, has done exactly what it said on the tin, because that's what happened. And from then on, my life became this synchronistic series of apparent coincidences that led me to people, to information, to personal experiences, to books, that was like handing me puzzle pieces in a jigsaw puzzle. Um, and and, and it, almost in the order, often mostly in the order, that made them most easy to see where they went. And this has built up and built up and built up. And it, it's just encompassed this vast range of subjects which appear on the surface to have no connection. But actually, if you go deep enough, that's the point, um, they're all fundamentally connected. Because what happens then, you stop seeing pixels and you start seeing pictures. You stop seeing strands and you start seeing webs and the world suddenly comes into a clarity. Oh, so that's what's going on. And that's why they do that, you know. So that's a, a real encapsulation of the story, really. Yeah, so does that still happen today? Do you still tune into that type of energy? Are you aware of it? Yeah, all the time. Um, when I'm writing a book, it's like sitting in an electromagnetic field. But what I've found is, uh, I mean, when I first started on this journey and I would be, say, writing or whatever or researching, at the end of the day, I would be absolutely exhausted. You know, uh, like psychics, uh, if they were channeling energy for, for hours, they'd be exhausted, wouldn't they? Yes, they would be, actually, yeah. But the longer I've gone on, it's almost like you sync with, the, you sync with the, that frequency and it becomes part of you. Yeah. So um, I don't get that exhaustion anymore, even though I'm obviously I'm much older than I was when I started out. I don't get that exhaustion anymore. But you do get the synchronicity. Mm -hmm. You know, I'll give you an, an example. I, I, I was, um, what, what would happen, what continues to happen, is that suddenly another subject comes up into your life. Uh, maybe it's just one thing, one piece of information. And then suddenly the same subject, which you haven't looked at before, is coming at you from all directions. Um, and it's, it's like saying, okay, this is what to look at next. Uh, and that's happened many times. And the, 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 the most important of all the subjects that have come into my life that way is the nature of reality. Mm. Because... That's my passion too, you know, all the other stuff, the names, dates, places, politics, financial uh, um, man manipulation, psychological manipulation, which is what it's all based on really. Um, that's interesting and it's important and that's why I talk about it. But the foundation of human control is key and, and limitation is keeping from us the nature of reality. Because if you can persuade people by marginalizing any alternative, basically, certainly in the mainstream, mm -hmm. that this world is solid, um, then what is a, so a solid world? What is a, quote, physical world? It's a world of absolute limitation. Look at all the I can'ts that come from living in a physical world. But when you realize it, it, it's not a physical world, it's a holographic world, which doesn't actually exist outside of us, but in here, um, then you start to realize that because it's malleable, it's energy, it's information, like a computer uh, decodes the internet onto the screen, then it becomes um, far more man, uh, malleable and changeable than it would be if 
it was actually solid. Now, if you are, because one of the things I, I say is that we, we, we're, we're living in two worlds. There's the world that we perceive we live in, and that has a certain knowledge base. But there's another world that is manipulating this world, okay. which has a vastly more expanded knowledge base about the nature of reality. And if you imagine um, that you, you manipulate the population to believe they live in a solid, limited world, um, and you get them to self-identify with their labels, their name, their sex, their race, their religion, whatever, their income bracket, and they perceive that to be who they are rather than just what they're experiencing. You get the population in that mode like that, and you, the, the few by comparison with the 7.5 billion, are coming from a completely different knowledge base. You understand what this reality is and how we interact with it and how our perceptions become our experience, like a self-fulfilling prophecy. And therefore, you know that if you can program through a human lifetime the perceptions of the population, you will, through that, dictate their experience. For instance, if you, um, if you have a perception of little me, I have no power, you will live a little me, I have no power life because the perception becomes the reality. If, if you come from the perception that I am, a, I, am a, uh, I am awareness, I am a state of being aware, I am a point of attention within an infinite state of awareness, and all these things that people identify with, name, date, sex, religion, all that stuff, are only experiences for that state of awareness. And that state of awareness is infinite when, 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 when the experience here, which is short and transitory, is over. It continues to um, explore uh, <coughs> eternity, infinity, all possibility. Then your sense of yourself is massively expanded. And therefore, what you can create as an experience is massively expanded. There is no little me perception from that perception of awareness. And therefore, you don't live a little me life. You live a life in which much more is possible because you um, have a greater um, understanding of, of the nature of, of who you are, of the I. Um, and so what we have is the population that is systematically herded into a perceptual prison that I call the postage stamp consensus um, by a network that knows that if they can dictate your perception, they will dictate your experience. And, and just, just look at it, uh, 7.5 billion live in a world that's ultimately controlled by a handful of people. That, that's only possible by psychological suppression of the target population. Who are these people? Well, um, as I've gone through the, as I've gone through the years, um, after that experience with the psychic, suddenly my life did become this synchronistic, um, this journey of information coming, and and also not only that, <laughs> imagine walking through a maze, but some hidden force is opening and closing the doors. So you go down the right channels and don't get lost in the, in, in the ones with, that lead nowhere. And it started in the early 90s where all the information coming to me um, as I traveled around the world was um, about, if you like, the world of the five senses, the world of the scene, the, the secret societies manipulating uh, politics and banking and business and wars and all the rest of it. And then from about 1995, 96, uh, suddenly the um, information started coming, again, in this synchronistic way, about the fact that behind the world of the scene and the, the people are in power in the world of the scene, like I say, what are now called the 1%, um, is a non-human non element, a non-human race that operates 
outside the visual frequency band of humanity, which if people would only care to look, is absolutely, ridiculously, almost hysterically small. People look through their eyes and they think, uh, uh, you know, I'm seeing everything there is to see. No, you're not. You're seeing a tiny frequency band called visible light, which is so tiny, it's ludicrous. And everything else in the infinity of everything is denied your uh, ability to, to visually perceive it. So when people say, well, why don't we see these this non-human force? Well, it's operating outside of visible light which is not difficult because almost everything that exists in all infinity is outside of visible light. And that we have um, a, a web structure whereby in the center is the spider. This is ultimately this non-human force. And then around the spider, if you think of strands around the spider at the center of the web, you have the most exclusive secret societies. Um, which are only for the, 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 the elite of the elite. And then as you come out from the spider in the web, then you, you're meeting then the secret societies that we do know about, the Freemasons, the Knights of Malta, the Knights Templar, and so on, the inner, inner core of the Jesuit order, and, and many more. Um, but they are fiercely compartmentalized. So most people who are Freemasons have no idea what, what Freemasons were being used for um, at its core. Like most Freemasons are on the bottom levels of degree, uh, the so-called blue degrees, uh, the bottom three levels. There are 33 levels of the Scottish Rite of Freemasonry. Um, and then you come out through that and you reach a point in the web, which I call uh, uh, the cusp organizations. These are semi-secret organizations in the sense that we know they exist, or at least if you research, you know they exist. Um, but um, they, uh, what they do is not known uh, at the core. These are the Bilderberg Group, the Trilateral Commission, the Council on Foreign Relations in America that's driven uh, American foreign policy since the 1920s, 1921, when it was formed. And, and, and basically what these cusp organizations do is take the agenda that comes out of the hidden and then they play it out through, because these organizations are basically amalgamations of politicians and bankers and, and all the, the people from all the different institutions, representatives of them, um, intelligence, all of it. And then it comes out through these cusp organizations into the public arena. And, and there we see it. We see governments. We see um, uh, government agencies. We see intelligence agencies. We see the military. We see the banking system. We see the corporations. And, and uh, to us, it appears that all these decisions that are clearly, when you, when you look at it, pushing the world and human society in a particular direction to more and more control, more and more centralization, more and more deletions of privacy and free speech, um, they appear to be um, decisions being made, made randomly. Like, I mean, what connection can they be between the Pentagon and Facebook? Actually, fundamental. Um, so, but when you, when you do the research, these decisions in the scene, in the world that we see that appear to be made randomly are actually coming ultimately from the hidden. And they're not random. They are pushing the world in a very clear direction. And, and what has happened, and, and it's one of the reasons that so many people now are looking at my work, A, because I've been pointing out that this was coming, for nearly 30 years now, but also because it's, it's, it's becoming clearer that um, it is um, happening in the sense of um, the world that I described and which Orwell described and Aldous Huxley described uh, in their books, uh, Brave New World in 1984, is actually coming to pass. And it's not coming to pass by random accident. It's coming to pass by um, cold uh, calculation. And uh, you see, there's a point where if you, if you see much of the time where I've been researching and exposing this, it's been operating under the radar. But there comes a point that if you're manipulating to transform society, 
there's a point where it has to break the surface. Otherwise, you're not going to transform it. You're not going to change it. And when it breaks the surface, then it's not just a theory anymore. It becomes a, an experience. And that's what's happening now. And it's, and, and it's getting faster. And the, the reason it's getting faster, well, two reasons. One, the more power you centralize, the quicker you can push that process of centralization and control. Um, and the other thing is, there is a point of great danger for this agenda once it breaks the surface. So what they're trying to do is squeeze the time between enough starting to happen that people say, hold on, what's going on? Hey, this is happening, to the point where the target population literally loses its ability to free think. And that's the point where um, they want to connect the human brain to artificial intelligence. And this is not just me um, pulling this out of the ether. If you look at the Silicon Valley crazies, because they are, um, they are talking about, some of them now, uh, that this, this is uh, due to happen, this connection, um, by 2030 that it's, it starts to happen. I'm talking in 2018. And, and some scientists now, of course, have come out and said, like the late um, Stephen Hawking, um, full-blown artificial intelligence connected to the human brain could be the end of the humanity. Well, I, I say, yeah, it, yeah, but you know something? That's the idea. Um, and when you f listen to people like uh, a complete crazy called Ray Kurzweil, he's a, a Silicon Valley Google executive, Oh, Google's just a search engine. Oh, really? Have a look a bit deeper. Um, he's uh, saying that once this connection is made, um, that artificial intelligence, as it becomes more and more intelligent than the human mind, uh, the human, human in, uh, uh, intelligence that we now understand and work with will become smaller and smaller and smaller until it is, in his words, um, basically negligible. At which point, the human mind that we think and perceive with now will be replaced by artificial intelligence. So what you think, what you feel, will come from that. Now, who's controlling that? And, and it's a, um, this is the end game where it's being led all along. Basically, what's been happening in this technological revolution is that Humanity has been manipulated to build its own prison, build its own mind prison. And just one other point, it'd be a good question to ask, well, why are they telling us? Why are they telling us they're going to do this? Because of the sales pitch. The sales pitch coming from Kurzweil and all these other Silicon Valley crazies is connection to artificial intelligence will make us superhuman. It will make us godlike, which is a, a term used by Kurzweil. No, no. It will make a subhuman. It will be the end of humanity as we know it. And that's the idea. So I'm just thinking about that. And um, it reminds me of Star Trek and the Borg and the, 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 the culmination of you talking about the, you know, um, the human mind being transformed, as you say, right. with, with, um, with um, AI. And so is that, is that the end game? Is that the end game for these unseen forces who are who are using um, certain organizations to as you say maybe enslave humanity yeah well, well let's um let's ask the big question in, re in in response to that what is AI what is it yeah I hear people go AI this AI that AI is taking over that AI is going to run the military all that stuff but what is it and you know this is why understanding reality and, and its nature is so important and why they don't want us to understand that. People think of life, an intelligent life, as because of our experience here, of only being possible if you have two arms, two legs, a head, and a torso. But consciousness, awareness, is not a form. It's a state of being. It is a state, literally, of awareness, of being aware. It can take endless forms. So what if, and I say it's not a what if, I swear at the road I've been going down and, and uncovering for all these years, what if this AI, I'm not talking about the 
algorithmic AI. I'm talking about the deeper levels of AI, which they're now calling strong AI and learning AI. And then beyond that, once you, once you have a connection between technology and the human brain, well, what the heck can come through that connection? Yeah. Oh, yes, just algorithms. Oh, really? You, you, you've convinced me. And what I'm saying, you, you mentioned the Borg in the question. Well, you know, one of the ways um, that the human mind is being prepared for all this is through sci-fi movies um, and such like. Um, and so when you see some of these concepts, they're actually very close to the truth. The Borg, of course, were a, um, a race that was uh, kind of part biological, part technological, which absorbed um, the minds, the consciousness, the awareness of races that it targeted in various parts of the, quote, galaxy. Um, and basically, that's in the simplest possible way what we are looking at. You see, up to this point, Humanity is being controlled by controlling information received, thus controlling and dictating the perceptions formed from that information. Because if you think of perception, it comes from information received. It might be a personal experience information. It might be the 10 o'clock news information. But from information, we form our perceptions. And from our perceptions comes everything. What we do, what we don't do, what we've challenged, what we won't challenge, what we'll accept, what we won't accept, accept, all come from our perceptions of a situation. So that's the way it's been done so far. And this is why now we're seeing more and more censorship through these uh, organizations like Facebook, Google, and so on, to stop alternative information challenging the information that forms the perceptions that this cabal wants people to have. But this next stage is to go f um, from controlling information, thus controlling perception, to the perceptions coming direct through AI. N no information control necessary. It's coming direct now. Your perceptions will come direct. And, of course, this world that we're going into, if we allow it, we are at the moment, is so vastly different, so far out, compared with the one we've known, especially as someone of my age, born in the 50s, 1950s, that that is, a chas that is a problem. That's a chasm problem. There's a perception problem. It's so different. It's like, what's going on? So one of the ways that that chasm is diluted and bridged is through something they call preemptive programming. And this is quite simple. What you do is you bombard people with movies, with TV programs, um, which depict the world you want to go into. And what that is doing, it's making the target population familiar with that world. Familiar subconsciously, even to an extent, familiar consciously with that world. So as that world comes in, in reality, to mirror what's been portrayed in movie after movie on television program after television program, the chasm of unfamiliarity is seriously diluted and, and the resistance to it and the questioning of it, therefore, is uh, very much diluted. And that's what's happening. If you, if you look at this process, uh, uh, movies, you're seeing uh, movies uh, based on um, control by robots controlled by technology. You're looking at movies increasingly, and I could talk about this forever as well, uh, uh, synthetic humans. Uh, and you're looking at dystopian societies where uh, there is enormous like Orwellian control. And they're, they're, they've all been pounded out in the last few decades because they're preparing us to... Um, Become familiar with that. Yeah. Now, this information you're receiving, and obviously you're sharing it with the many people who want to listen to you, to, uh, do you see yourself as actually someone who is um, 
trying to inform society that it needs to change, that it has to be aware of what's going on. Oh, big time. Yeah, you see, um, by the way, I don't, I don't get this information, uh, you know, I don't channel this information. Yeah. Um, what I get are insights, but the insights are then backed up by hard names, date, places, journalistic information. So um, I don't just say, well, I'm getting this and this is what's happening. I say, this is, this is what, what, what I'm saying is happening and here's the evidence to show. Um, uh, so so um, it's, a, it's a journalistic exercise, yeah. but, but a journalistic exercise in a way that very little journalism uh, otherwise is done. Okay. Open-minded journalism where the information uh, dictates the direction you go, not preconceived idea and and um, uh, holding on to certain uh, perceptions of how things are and, and and clinging to them till your knuckles turn white. But the thing is, um, if you if you look at how, like I said a few minutes ago, people's perceptions are formed, it's through the information received. So literally all I'm doing is saying, hey, Here's another way of looking at it. Yeah. Make of it what you will. I'm not, absolutely not saying you must believe it. Oh, I'm the guru. You must believe it. Because, you know, we're drowning in people who are standing up and saying, you must believe what I say. If what I say has validity, mm -hmm. the information itself will prove the validity by how much sense it makes to people in the, in the, in the face of, of, of their experience. Um, and so um, I'm uh, not some... Messiah who's turned up to save the world. I'm saying there's another way of looking at the world here. See what you think. Yeah. And what's been happening, the more and more that this world I've been talking about is coming to pass. Uh, people are looking at this now. Of, of all age groups, of all backgrounds, system people you thought would never open their mind to anything beyond the norm are looking at it now. Um, and saying, actually, this does actually make sense of the world that, that's unfolding. But you have forecast certain events, um, like 9-11, the banking crisis, and microchipping. Your own words were saying you were telling about these events still <laughs> to happen. So you were taking a journalistic approach, but also going into another source to get that well, information as well. Well, yes and no. I, I t I'll tell you where that information comes from. You see, it's, it's real simple. Um, Aldous Huxley, when he wrote Brave New World in 1932, or it came out in 1932, when George Orwell wrote 1984 in 1948, they weren't coming entirely from their imagination. This is why they've been so accurate. Um, I quote a man in my books um, called Dr. Richard Day, who was a big Rockefeller family insider who stood up in front of pediatricians in Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania in 1969 um, and asked them to turn off recording equipment and not take notes because he was going to tell them how the world was going to change because what he represented was going to change. It was only a gopher for it, but he, he, knew, he, knew, he knew what the agenda was. And um, he described the internet. He described the internet in 1969. He said that what we're going to do is have massive migrations of people into, into countries to break up their, uh, their culture because the uh, cultures are all around the world, not just one culture, not just European culture, but cultures in general around the world um, were no part of this new world. It was going to be one blob global, global culture controlled by the few, basically. Um, and um, he also said, by the way, in 1969, we're going to make uh, boys and girls the same. Uh, and so where did they get this information from? How did they know this? Because, as I said earlier, there's the world we live in and it's knowledge base. And there's the world that manipulates this world, that interpenetrates it, appears to be the same, but it's not, that works on a completely different knowledge base. And if you can tap into that world through research or because you're born into it or whatever, you know what the agenda is. Now, um, the, the knowledge base of this manipulating world is so far ahead of the one we perceive that actually technology that's coming in now, we go, whoa, have you seen it? It's been known by that 
for all along. The question is, um, how do we um, create a nav- narrative and a cover story that we can keep introducing this uh, uh, technology that we've had f- for so long into the into public society in a way that they will buy the idea that spontaneously someone's inventing it and developing it. And that, so you have cover stories like people inventing some new technology uh, behind a garage door somewhere in California. Um, I, I watched a BBC documentary on um, Silicon Valley, double uh, documentary. Being the BBC, it don't go very far, of course. But there was one sequence that was hilarious. It was hilarious to me. They, they had this sequence, sequence of garage doors and they kept saying what had been developed behind this garage door and this garage door and this garage door. I mean, I could imagine someone in the cover story uh, 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 department saying, hold on, hey guys, too many garage doors, mate. We need to change the narrative. No, no, more, no more it's invented behind garage doors, right? Too many. They'll, they'll, they'll start questioning. Um, and so um, if you can tap into this level of knowledge, you can predict technology that doesn't exist at the time you're writing. This is why Aldous Huxley was able to describe in Brave New World genetic and drug-based control that was not possible in 1932. This is how Orwell could uh, predict telescreens, for instance, whereby uh, the television is watching you. These are smart TVs with, with audio and camera technology to, to listen and, and watch what you're doing in your own front room. And of course, what we're seeing with the smart TVs is only uh, uh, parts uh, or, or Mark 1, 2 or whatever. It's not where it's meant to end. Dr. Richard Day in 1969 described smart TVs. We didn't see them till 2008. So um, where I'm going with this in answer to the question is I've spent 30 years trying to uncover this world. And in doing so, it's very simple. Once you start to uncover what the agenda is for the world, unless something comes along to intervene, which is the whole point of what I do to make that happen, then if you say this is what is planned, Unless there's an intervention, it happens. And people say you're predicting the future. Well, only only in one sense. What I'm doing is pointing out where this agenda is meant to go. And if there's no intervention, it becomes the future. The, the whole point of what I do is not to be proved right. It's, it's for it not to happen. That, that's why I'm trying to alert people. Um, and so it's, it's not sitting in the ether, like I, I say, pulling this out. It's actually hard research and talking to people who operate in that world but don't like it, who tell you um, what the plan is. And um, basically, I'm, uh, I'm tapping in to what Orwell did and Huxley did and Dr. Richard Day did and so many others who predicted the future. Do you know, I, I talked to someone in America some years ago now, and I was talking about this, and uh, she came up to me. She said, you know, I, I can understand what you're saying, you know, about this agenda. She said, um, me and my husband were um, in a campaign. This is in the 1970s, about 1971. We were in a campaign because our bank dropped checkbooks and they, 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 they caused quite a fury about it. And the bank manager, just the bank manager, not the head of the banking system, but of course, if you're a member of the Secret Society Network and you go deep enough, then bingo, uh, you, um, you get access to what this projection is. And he, she said, he sat there and he said to us, look, he said, I understand your concern about checkbooks disappearing and, and that. He said, but what you've got to understand is that we're going to a point where there's going to be no cash and there's going to be no form of um, uh, money and the circulation of money and the exchange of money that isn't basically electronic, one electronic currency. 
So, you know, you, you, you can complain about checkbooks now, but it don't really matter because it's not just checkbooks going. Eventually, credit cards are going to go. The whole thing's going to go. It's just going to be digital money and a microchip. That's yeah, yeah. right. So this is a bank manager that knew about this. Um, so it, it, you just, you're just tapping into this hidden agenda and saying to people, hey, this is what they plan. And that's why uh, my books have been so accurate because I've just been repeating what the plan is, basically. Yeah. You do look on society or certainly the, the um, influences behind um, what's going on is very, very negative and dystopian. Is there any hope for humanity? Is there, is there any, can we look at certain figures within society, within powerful positions who are looking to be on the good side, shall we say, who are not part of that secret right. society? Well, um, there must be some hope. What I, what I would say um, is um, if you're looking for someone, if people out there, yeah. if you're looking for someone in a position of power to change this, well, go and find a mirror. Yeah. Because then you're looking at it. You see, yeah. this is why um, all the way through this, I've never written a book and never done a talk about the nature of the problem without uh, going into the nature of reality and how we are not this, um, this powerless being with a name and an income bracket and a race and, and what have you. Um, we are the consciousness having the experience. And if you can move your self-identity from I am my labels to I am the awareness having a brief experience as those labels. And, and again, you go beyond that and you realize that every other point of attention, this is why racism is so ludicrous. Mm. Um, every other point, and, and self-identity with, with, with race too. I'm not saying you should, you know, people shouldn't enjoy their culture and, and love their culture and love, love their racial type and that's brilliant, but realize it's not who you are. It's just a brief experience of your awareness. And, and if we realize that all these different points of attention that have different color vehicles and backgrounds are all points of attention within the same one infinite state of awareness, then you start to realize that we're actually all expressions of each other and not these kept apart um, different names and labels, which create what? The absolutely essential foundation of any few controlling the many, divide and rule. Look at the fault lines that are created to play off race against race, religion against religion, income bracket against uh, income bracket. And these, these labels which create this division, um, they're being subdivided and subdivided now into the minutiae of, um, of self-identity. Where, where you, you, these, um, these code letters for an identity, they're getting longer and longer and longer and longer. People are so obsessed with the minutiae of what, what they are. I am are this, I am are that. Well, fair enough, but just get on with your life. I am transgender. Good, good luck to you. But why do you have to have the, all these bloody letters? What is that doing? I am are, I am are. Where is, where is the fact that we're all one consciousness having an experience when your minutiae of self-identity is so tiny. It's pulling people out of their true eye into the illusory, what I call phantom self-eye. And, 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 and every minutiae subdivision is another potential fault line for divide and rule. And, and look, we're now having feminists having conflict with transgender people. Yeah. What well, I mean, what the heck? Get on with your life. I was simple, you know, my philosophy is it, it, real simple. Do what you like, so long as you don't impose it on anyone else. Yeah. Right? 
And people say, oh, well, I mean, you can do what you like. Hold on a minute. You just hold on a second. Do what you like so long as you don't impose it on anyone else. The last bit is the key because if, if someone wants to be this, fair enough. Someone wants to believe this, fair enough. Good luck to you. The, the, the problem comes when you want to impose what you believe or what you perceive yourself to be on other people. Then the conflict starts. Then the tyranny starts. This um, perception of I, this label, must have more power over your label. My religious belief must have more power than yours. Um, and, and by the way, uh, you know, uh, if, if, you're, if you're a child born into, into my family and I believe this religion, you must follow this religion. That's child abuse in my view. Yeah. Um, and, and so you have this imposition constantly when you look around the world of parents imposing their view on life on the child, their, their uh, um, religion on the child. You have all these other labels seeking to impose themselves on the, on, on, on the rest of the population. So now with political correctness, the, the number of opinions you can have is getting squeezed and squeezed and squeezed and squeezed and squeezed. And it's being done at the same time that uh, the censorship is being squeezed and squeezed and squeezed. And where we're heading, which has been the design all along, look at 1984, is to have only one narrative of everything that people have access to because everything else is banned. And, and to not be able to criticise anything, even if it deserves it, because it's politically incorrect to do so. When you have professors who are sacked for saying that men and women are biologically different, you are in not only a tyranny, you are in a lunatic asylum, right? And the last time I looked, I had things that women don't have. There is a biological aspect to this. But what we're heading into, and this is all part of Orwell, if only people would look at it, we're heading in to a post-fact society. You see, uh, that's what Orwell described in 1984, and not from only, only his imagination either. Um, once you go into a post-fact society where facts don't matter, when you, when you can no longer say, as Orwell put it, that two and two equals four, you have to accept it equals five, otherwise you get a Twitter storm abuse. Then we're in a, we, we're in a world where freedom is dead. As, as uh, Orwell said in his book, as long as basically these words, as long as you can keep saying two and two equals four, we're basically in a world of freedom where, where fact-based debate can happen. Once you can't say that anymore and you have to accept it equals five, it's all over. That's when uh, war can be sold as peace, Yeah. when slavery can be sold as freedom and all the other things he talked about. I'll give you one last question, David. And um, it goes back to um, belief in humanity and the fact, do you believe that there's life after death? Oh, 100%. No, no, there's, 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 there's life after life. Life after life, so <laughs> yes, yes. Yes, you see, this is, this is the whole point. Because of this um, self-identity with the labels, what does that mean? It means self-identity with the body. So the body becomes the arbiter of life. It's a vehicle. You know, when you get out of your car or your car goes to the scrapyard, you know, you don't perceive that you're going to the scrapyard with it, do you? It's a vehicle. And, and this is a vehicle, and this is also something which explains why people get so confused and bewildered about this world. This vehicle is actually a biological computer. It's taking information. I explain this in the books in great detail. It's taking information, waveform information. Think of Wi-Fi, like a computer and Wi-Fi. And it is... It is um, like the five senses, they take waveform information, like the ear with sound, for instance, and they turn it into electrical information that goes to the brain. And then the brain um, decodes that into digital holographic information. And that's where the world is. It's in here. It appears to be outside, but it's not. It's in here. 
I would therefore we can change it by changing in here. It's that simple. They don't want us to know that. They want us to think this is physical and it's all out there because then, well, how do you change that? That's the whole idea. Um, so um, what, um, what has been lost is the fact that the I is a state of awareness and, and, and it comes to um, experience through this body and the body's decoding mechanisms are only such, for instance, like I said earlier, it can only decode visual reality up to a certain narrow band called visible light. Um, what psychics and people like that are doing, and mediums, the good ones, not the fakes, the good ones, the, the genuine ones, is they're able to tease out their perceptions and connections to their awareness beyond this narrow band of frequency that the body can decode and no more. And thus they are able to access information that's not available in the, the world of the body decoding uh, sense of awareness and, and, and bring some uh, very important information into this reality. And all that happens when, um, when we so-called die is the vehicle ceases to function and at that point, that which has been uh, experiencing through it is released from the, uh, fr from the body's um, focus of attention. So what do near-death experiences say? One after the other, millions of them that have had these experiences. Since when I left the body, when my body died, before they, it was revived, I went into a I went into a world where basically I could see past, present and future at the same moment, where I had massive uh, uh, expansion of awareness, where I could still see, although I didn't have eyes anymore. This is all an illusion. It's all an illusion. And, and, and it's keeping us in this illusion that keeps us in a sense of powerlessness. Uh, and, and once people see actually... Uh, who they thought they were, who they've been told they are, is an infinitesimal fraction of who they really are, then this whole house of cards will come down because this whole conspiracy is based on keeping the, the target population in ignorance of its true self, in ignorance of its true power. And when that starts to return, and it is returning, then this house of cards is going to come down because that's what it is, a house of cards based on ongoing human ignorance. Thank you, David. Pleasure. Thank you very Thank much. You. I enjoyed it. And I